I wanted to, to, uh, to go back uh, to the 1950s when there was a consensus among politics, when Republicans and Democrats were pretty close together, when there was a, a middle class, when people agreed on things. I wanted to read a quote that you have, a marvelous quote that I, I had heard before, but a quote from, from Eisenhower in a letter that he sent to his brother, and here it is. Should any political party attempt to abolish Social Security, unemployment insurance, and eliminate labor laws and farm programs, you would not hear of that party again in our political history. There's a tiny splinter group, of course, that believes you can do these things. Among them are H.L. Hunt. You possibly know his background. A few other Texas oil millionaires and an occasional politician or businessman from other areas. Their number is negligible, and they are stupid. <laughs> Fifty-four. The Republican president. The United States. Republican president. Now, now, how did how did that all change around in twenty years? Um, it's actually a bit more than twenty years, but it, uh, okay. So here's what happened. Um, it's really two things happened. One is that a a movement, uh, a, a hardline, basically radical movement, took over the Republican Party. So you know, yes, yes, Virginia, there is a vast part of conspiracy. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not. There, there, it's, 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 it's perfectly open. There, there is a whole set of overlapping institutions that, uh, in effect, uh, enforce a right-wing orthodoxy. Everything from the Heritage Foundation to Fox News. Um, they are cohesive. There's an ideological common thread. Um, and if you if you look at the funding sources. Uh, although there are many, many different institutions, they all have the same set of donors. You go and look underneath and you find uh, um, Richard Mellon Scaife and, uh, and Coors and Koch and uh, Smith Richardson and Bradley providing uh, uh, crucial funds for institution after institution. Um, actually, I've always thought that the, the sort of crazy demonization of George Soros uh, on the right, it's partly you know they're just looking for for a villain. It's partly a uh, little bit of anti-Semitism, but it's partly that the idea that that uh, an evil billionaire is, is coordinating everything. Well, that is the way things work in their world. So uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, so this is this work and it really has a has a tremendous effect. It's, it it has pushed the Republican Party far to the right of where public opinion is. It, there are. You know, the, the, the public has never really bought into the idea that, uh, certainly the public has never bought into the idea that Social Security ought to be dismantled, uh, but this is a sort of fundamental claim. Um, and it's been able to win elections. That's the crucial thing. Although people have never bought into the ideology, this right-wing movement. I, I call it movement conservatism in the book, which is not my term. It's what they themselves call it. And if, you, if you Google movement conservative, you'll find a bunch of conservatives talking about being movement conservatives. Uh, the, uh, uh, the ability to win elections has been crucial, and the ability to win elections uh, has come from the exploitation of other issues, not economics, but other issues. Uh, and so that's the, the you know the big story of the book. I don't know how far we're going, but the, uh, the so those issues, other issues, have included, of course, national security, moral values, religion. The 2004 election was you know, Bush won by being the defender of the nation against gay married terrorists, but the, uh, um, uh, but above all race. Uh, the, the, the core of the story of what happened to America is the long term that began after the civil rights movement. The, the great uh, uh, exploitation of the race issue, which is what pushed American politics to the right. I mean, there's that, that uh, famous quote from, uh, from Lyndon Johnson who talked to uh, to Bill Moyers, you know, and said uh, after the Civil Rights Act, I, I think I've I've shifted the, the South to, to to the Republican Party for the next generation. He said, I've given the South to the Republicans for for my lifetime and yours to a very young Bill Moyers, and so far that appears to be about right. And by the way, one of the I, mean, I, I do I'm, I'm a I'm a data hound, right? I love I love numbers and these things, and the um, because they're they're. I try not to put too many in the book, but uh, but here's here, we all know that uh, white men have left the Democratic Party, and they've left it because it's you know it's weak on national security and it doesn't like guns and it's um, the the, uh, the nanny state and you know, a whole list of reasons. None of which is true because the fact is that outside the South, white men have not left the Democratic Party. Uh, in 1952. 40% of non-Southern white men voted Democratic. 
Uh, in 2004, 39% of non-Southern white men voted Democratic. All that happened was that Southern whites switched parties. It's amazing how, once you take into account the, the great Southern, the, the fact that Southern whites started voting Republican after the Civil Rights Movement, there's not much left to explain. And that has been the basis of the political strategy. Now, Richard Nixon had the famous, the Southern strategy, um, based on, on basically exploiting the backlash against civil rights. And that has been throughout. Uh, so, uh, well, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I want to launch into my uh, explanation of who Ronald Reagan really was, but we can talk about that if you did. Well, you think, well, feel free. Yeah, let me just... I, I, I wanted to just say that, that, that things, things changed so quickly. And, and, and uh, you know, in 1980, when Ronald Reagan took office, you know, as you say in the book, the rich were no richer relative to the average American than they had been in the Eisenhower years. And just a few years before that, still 27% of the, of the labor force were unions. And, and how quickly things change. And, and there are people uh, of my generation, you know, who, who, who talk about how you know, the left has to continue, or liberals have to continue to win, they have to continue to win, but the conservatives only have to win one time. That is, if you want to nationalize an industry, um, you know, you can do that only under great, uh, great political revolutionary times, or great, uh, great upheaval, or some, something that, uh, an external event. But once you privatize it, you can privatize a national industry almost overnight, and then reclaiming it becomes extremely difficult. You can drop a 91% tax rate um, down to 50 and 30 and 20%, but to raise it back to 91%, nobody would even conceive as, as possible. So you talk about raising it by 5% or 7%. So how do you... How do you I'm not sure that's optimistic right. In that I think if you can create programs, they... Uh, the, the lesson in history, I think, is that if you create great middle class programs, things that make people's lives more secure, uh, then they become very, very hard to, um, uh, to undo. I mean, um, and like I said, I'm feeling so, so optimistic that, that my friends think I might be uh, uh, having problems. But, the, uh, but the, the beginning of my optimism really came in, uh, in the spring of 2005 when we had the great fight over Social Security. And, you know, the, this was, uh, Bush said he had his mandate, and the, if you went to the conventional wisdom of politics inside the Beltway, it was all, oh, you know, of course he's going to succeed in, in privatizing, it. it's basically going to unravel the system. Um, and I'd like to say, well, you know, those of us who doggedly shot down the arguments one after another, Wanted, but what really happened was the, the American public basically said, "Hey, we we really like this program. Uh, there just was no um, there was no appetite in the country for the the right wing agenda on this. It, it uh, and in fact, even the red states were as as hostile to the idea of privatizing Social Security as blue states. It just um, if we if we had you know if we had well we had Medicare. Medicare was deeply controversial when, when it." Uh, was being proposed. Uh, Ronald Reagan made a recording uh, for the American Medical Association that was supposed to be played. It was actually called Operation Coffee Cup. It was uh, to be played at coffee clutches by doctors' wives to convince people of the evils of socialized medicine, uh, meaning Medicare. And um, now Medicare is, is very, very difficult. Newt Gingrich tried to gut it and, and didn't succeed. And uh, of course, it, part of the problem is, is, is having people understand what, what, what it means. It's, I do mention the, the famous uh, the constituent who uh, yelled at, at, at her senator. Uh, senator, don't let the government get its hands on Medicare. Um, <laughs> but it's a very real, you know, this is, um, uh, it, the, the, if we can get this, but there's one of the reasons again, I, I know I'm jumping forward, but if we, if we had universal health care, um, and I think there's, reasonable odds that we will not to in the future, um, it will become untouchable. It will become something that every American uh, views as his or her birthright, as they should. I, I, 